The Science of Deduction Chapter 2 We met next day as he had arranged and inspected the rooms at number 221B Baker Street of which he had spoken at our meeting. They consisted of a couple of comfortable bedrooms and a single large airy sitting room, cheerfully furnished as illuminated by two broad windows. So desirable in everywhere the apartments and so moderate did he turn scene which he divided between us that he bargain was concluded upon the spot and we went once entered the position that were evening I moved my things round from the hotel and on the following morning Sherlock Holmes followed me with several boxes and portmates. For a day or two or we were busily employed in unpacking and laying out our property to do best advantage. That done, we gradually began to settle down and to accommodate ourselves to our new surroundings. Holmes was certainly not a difficult man to live with. He was quiet in his ways and his habits were regular. It was rare for him to be up after ten at night and he had innumerable breakfasted and going on before I rose in the morning. Sometimes he spent his day at the chemical laboratory, sometimes in the dissecting rooms and occasionally in long walks which appeared to take him into the so lowest portraits of the city. Nothing could exist his energy when the working field was upon him, but now and again a reaction would seize him and for days on end he would lie upon a sofa in the sitting room, hardly uttering a word of moving a muscle from morning to night. On these occasions I have noticed such a dreamy way and expression in his eyes that I may have suspected him to being addicted to the use of some narcotic and not the temperance and clearness of his whole life forbidding such a notion. As the weeks went by, my interest in him and my circles led to his aims in his life gradually deepened and increased. His very person and appearance were subject to strike to the attention of the most casual observer. In head he was rather on six feet and so excessively learned that he seemed to be considerably tired. His eyes were sharp and pressing say during those intervals of torpor to which I have allowed, and his thin hair like noise giving him all expression, an air of alternance and decision. His chain too had its consequences which marked the man of determination. His hands were innumerable brooded with link and stained with chemicals, yet he was possessed to extraordinary delicacies of touch and frequently had occasion to observe when I watched him manipulating his fragile philosophical instruments. Really, really there may set me down as a hopeless pussy body when I confess how much this man stimulated my curiosity and how often I endeavored to break through the ratings which me show only all concert himself. Before pronouncing judgment, however, be it remembered how object this way my life and how little three was engaged my attention. My health forbid me from wintering out unless the weather was exceptionally general and I had no friends who would call upon me and break my monotony of my daily existence. Under the circumstances I usually had the little mystery which hung out my companion and spent much of time in adventuring and unwearing it. He was not studying medicine. He had me himself been replied to questions confirming Stanford's opinion upon the point. Never did he appear to have pursued any course of reading which made fit him for a degree in science or any other recognized portal which would give him interest into the learned world. Yet the zeal the certain studies was remarkable and with eccentric hymns of knowledge was extraordinarily ample and meaning that his observations have fairly as taunted me. Surely no man would work so hard or retain such praise information unless he had some definite end in the view. The, the solitary readers are said and remarkable for the extents of their learning. No man burdens his mind with small matters unless he has some very good reason for doing no. His ignorance was as remarkable as his knowledge of contemporary literature, philosophy and politics he appeared to know next to nothing upon my quoting. Tom Scatley had inquired in the nearest way he might be and what he had done. 
My surprise reached a climax, however, when I found incidentally that he was ignorant of the Cap America theory of the composition of solar system that any civilized human being in the 19th century should not be aware that the Earth traveled around. The sun appeared to be to me such an extraordinary fact that I could hardly realize. You appear to be astonished, he said, smiling at my expression of surprise. Now that I do know it, I shall do my best to forget it. You forget it? Yes, he explained. I consider that a man praying originally is like a little empty attic. And you have to stock it with such furniture as you choose. A fool takes in all the lumber of every sort that he can across, so that the knowledge which may be useful to him gets crowded out or all best at jumping up with the love of older things so that he has a difficulty in lying, he hands up on it. Now the skillful workman is very careful indeed as so to what he takes into the brain attic. He will have nothing but the tools which may help him doing his work, but of this he has a large instrument and all in the most perfect order. It's a mistake to think that the little room had elastic walls and can't distance in any extent. Depend you upon in three comes a time when for every addition of knowledge you forget something that you knew before. It's of the highest importance, therefore, not to have useless facts elbowing out the useful ones. But the solar system, I protest, what the deuce is it to me? He interpreted impatiently. You say that we go round the sun. If we went round the moon, it would not make a penny worth of difference to me or to work. I was on my point of asking him what work may be, but something in his manner showed me that the question would be an one. I pondered over a short conversation, however, and endeavored to draw my deduction from it. He said that the world acquired a knowledge which did not bear upon his object. Therefore, all the knowledge which he persisted was such a would be useful to me. I enarmated my own mind on the various points, upon which he had shown me that he was exceptionally well formed. I haven't looked to pass in and jot them down. I could not help smelling at the document when I had completed it. I ran in this way. Sherlock Holmes, his lemons. Knowledge of literature, Nile. Philosophy, Nile. Astronomy, Nile. Politics, Phoebe, Botany, wearable, well up in Balodana, Opium and Poser generally knows nothing in practical jardining. Geology, practical but limited. Tell as a glance different soul from each other as, as a fox he shown my specials upon his trousers and told me by their color and consistence in what part of London he had received them. Chemistry, profound anatomy, a great but and systematic. Sensational literature. Immense. He appears to know every detail of every horror perpetrated in the century. Plays the violin well. Is an except single stick player, boxer, and swordsman. Has a good practical knowledge of British law. When I had got so far in my list, I threw in out of the fire of despair. If I can only find that the fellow was driving at my reconciling on these accomplishments, and discovering a calling which needs them all. I said to myself, I may as well give up the attempt at once. I see that I have allowed above this poor dupe on the wild. These were very remarkable, but this eccentric hold of all their accomplishments that he could play pieces and difficult as play as some of Mandelstein's leader and our favorites. When left to himself, however, he would seldom produce any music or attempt any recognized air. Learning back in his armchair of any evening, he would close his eyes and scrape colors at the feet which was thrown across his knee. Sometimes the crowds were sonorous and melancholy. Occasionally they were fantastic and cheerful. Clearly they reflected the thoughts which possessed him, but whether the music added those thoughts or whether the playing was simple to results of a warm fancy was more than I could determine. I made a blade against this experimenting souls had it not been that usually terminated. 
then by playing in quick section and wall series of my favorite series as a slight combination for the trial open by page. During the first week or so we had no sales and I had begun to think that my companion was a friendless as man I was myself. Presently, however, I found that he had many acquaintances and those in the most different classes of society. There was one little sallow, red-faced, dark-eyed fellow who was introduced to me as Mercer Lestrade and who came three or four times in a single week. One morning, a young girl called fashionably dressed and stayed for half an hour or more. The same afternoon brought a gray headed city visitor looking like a Jew peddler who appeared to me to be much excited and who was closely followed by a slipshot elderly woman. On another occasion an all white haired gentleman had an interview with my companion and on another airway portrait in his volunteer uniform. When any of these non-scripts individual put in the apartment Sherlock Holmes used to beg for the use of sitting room and I would retire to my bedroom. He always apologized to me for putting me to this inconvenience. I have to use the rules as a place of business, he said, and these people are my clients. Again, I had an opportunity of asking him a point black questions, and again, my delicacy prevented me from forcing another man to confide in me. I imagine at the time that he had some strong reason for not alluding to it, but he soon displayed the idea by coming round to the subject of his own record. It was upon the 4th of March, as I have good reason to remember that I rose somewhat earlier than usual and found that Sherlock Holmes had not yet finished his breakfast. The landlady had become too accustomed to my late habits that my place had not been laid nor my coffee prepared. With the unreasonable pertinence of Mark and I rang to bell and give a cart information that I was ready. Then I picked up a magazine from the table and attempted to while away the time with it, while my companion munched silently at the toes. One of the articles had a pencil mark at the heading, and I naturally began to run me, I throw it. It somewhat ambitious still was, the book of life and it attempted to show how much an observant man may learn by an accurate and systematic examination of all that came in the way. It struck me as being a remarkable mixture of shepherds and obstruity. The reasoning was close and intense, but the deduction appeared to me to be far-fetched and exerted. The writer claimed by a momentary expression a twitch of muscle or a glance of an eye to fathom a man's inmost thoughts. The sight, according to him, was an impossibility in the case of one trained to observation and analysis. The conclusions were as infallible as so many propositions of Euclid. So starting with his results appeared to be an enchant then anti they learned the process by which he had arrived at them they made well consider him as a narcomancer. From a drop of water, said the writer, a longer could enter the possibility of an Atlantic or Niagara without having seen or heard of one or the other. So all life is great change, the nature of which is known whenever we are shown in single link of it. Like all other arts, the science of deduction and analysis is one which can only be acquired by long and patient study on its life long enough to allow my mortal and attain the highest possible perfection in it. Before turning to those moral and mental aspects of the matter which presents the greatest difficulties, let the inquirer begin by mastering more elementary problems. Let him, on meeting to fellow mortal learn to glance of distinguish the history of the man and the trade or profession to which he belongs. Purely as such an exercise might seem it sharpens the faculties of observation and teach one where to look and what to look for. By a man's fingernails, by his corn sleeve, by his boot, by his trousers knees, by the colosses of the foreign finger and thumb, by his expression, by his shift cuffs, by each of these things, a man calling a plainly reverted 
That's all you know, I should fall to anything of competent inquiry in my case is almost inconceivable. What in fun about Tweddy? I cried slapping the magazine down on the table. I never read such rubbish in my life. What is it? asked Sherlock Holmes. Why the article? I said, pointing at it with my ex spoon as I set down my breakfast. I see that you have read it since you have marked it. I don't deny that it's similarly written. It erades my throat. It's evidentially the theory of some armchair lover who evolves all this natal little paradox in the seclusion of his own study. It is not practical. I should like to see him crap down in a third class carriage on the underground and ask to give the trades off all the fellow travelers. I would lay the thousands to one against him. You would lose your money, Sherlock Holmes remarked Ken. As for the article, I wrote it myself. You? Yes, I have to turn both for observation and for deduction. The theories which I expressed there and which appear to you to be chemically are really extremely practical. So practical that I depend upon them for my bread and cheese. And how I asked involuntarily. Well, I have a trade of my own. I suppose I am the only one in the world. I am consulting detective. If you can understand what this is, there is a London we have a lot of government detectives and a lot of private ones. When these fellows and are at fault, they come to me and I manage to put them on the right scan. They love all the evidence before me and I am generally able, by the help of my knowledge of history of crime, to set them straight. There is a strong family resemblance about misdeeds, and if you have all the details of thousands at your finger ends, it is odd if you can unroll the thousands at first. Lestrade is a well-known detective. He was himself into a four recently over the forgery case, and that was what brought him here. And these other people, they are mostly sent on my private inquiry agencies. They are all people who are in trouble about something and what a little eighteening. I listen to their story, they listen to my comments and then I pocket my fee. But do you mean to say, I said, that without leaving your room you can unroll some note which other men can make nothing of although they have seen a detail of themselves? Quite so. I have a kind and intuition the way. Now and again I case turns up which is a little more complex than I have to bustle about the see things with my own eyes. You see I have a lot of special knowledge which I apply to the problem and which facilities laid down in the article which arrows your scorn and invaluable to me in practical work. Observation with me is a second nature. You appear to be surprised when I told you on our first meeting that you had come from Afghanistan. You were told me, no doubt, nothing of the short. I knew you came from Afghanistan. From long habit, the train of thoughts ran the swiftly through my mind that I arrived at the conclusion without being on sequence of intermediate steps. There were such steps, however. The train of reasoning ran. Here's a gentleman of a medical type by with the air of military men. Clearly an army doctor then. He has just come from the tropics. For his face is dark and that is not the natural thing of the skin. For his wrists are fair. He has undergone hand trip and sickness as he hedge face says clearly. His left arm has been injured. He holds in the staff an unnatural mental. Where in the tropics could an English army doctor have seen much handship and got him hard wounded clearly in Afghanistan. The wall train of throw did not occupy a second. I then marked that you came from Afghanistan and you were astonished. It's simple enough as you explain it, I said, smiling. You remind me of Edgar Allan Poe's Dupin. I had no idea that such individuals did exist outside of stories. Sherlock Holmes rose and lit the peep. No doubt you think that you are complimenting me, it's comparing me to Dupin, he observed. Now in my opinion Dupin was a very inferior fellow. 
the trick of his breaking in on his friends so with the April Lemark after a quarter of an hour silence is really weird show and superical. He had some analytical genius, no doubt, but he was by no means such a phenomenon as Poe appeared to imagine. Have you read Gabriel's works? I asked. Does Leck come up in your my idea of detective? Sherlock Holmes sniffed sardinically. Lecker was a miserable bungler, he said in an angry voice. He had only one thing to recommend him, and that was his energy. That book made me positively ill. The question was how I identify an unknown prisoner I could have done it in 24 hours. Lecoq took Sigma or so, it may be made a textbook for detectives to which them would to avoid. I felt rather underground and having two characters who I had admired traded in his scholar style. I walked over to the window and stood looking out into the busy street. The fellow may be very clever, I said to myself, but he is certainly very constant. There are no crimes and no criminals in these days, he said, Curry. Honestly, what is the use of having brains in our profession? I know well that I have it in my to make my name famous. No, man lives or has ever lived who had brought the out study and natural talent detection of crime which I have done. And what is the result? There is no crime to detect or at most some bungling willing with a motive so transparent that even a Scotland Yard official can see through it. I was still around at the bumptious style of conversation. I thought it best to change the topic. I wonder what the fellow is looking for, I asked pointing to a stalwart prank dressed individual who was walking slowly down the other side of the street looking anxiously at the numbers. He had a large blue envelope in his hand and was evidently the better of message. You mean the retired sergeant of mariners? said Sherlock Holmes. Bragg and Burns thought it myself. He knows that I cannot verify his guess. The throw had hardly passed through my mind when the man whom we were watching outside of the number on our door and ran rapidly across the roadway. We heard a loud knock, a deep voice below, a heavy steps, a sounding dessert. For Mr. Sherlock Holmes, he had stabbing into the moram and handing my friend a letter. Here was an opportunity of taking the consent out of him, the little throw of his when he made the random shot. May I ask, my lad, I said in the placement voice, what his trade may be? Commissionary say, he said gravely, and for him away from repairs. And you were, I asked with a Sally Melchior's glance at my companion. A sergeant said, Royal Marine Light, infertly said, No one, sir? Right, sir. A click, his fell together, raised his hands in a salute, and was gone.